Welcome back. Today we will be looking at a new lecture on response surface methodology. Again, you might have come across this term when you were reading research papers or books on statistical design of experiments. This is a very popular tool and widely used in the industry. This is simply based on the concepts we have studied until now and uh, involves an optimization exercise. So, uh, the purpose of any experimental work would be to uh, identify optimum conditions for uh, uh, the production, so that uh, you want to either uh, maximize the yield conversion to the desired product or minimize the power consumption or minimize the time required to complete the job. So, these are all uh, important optimization objectives and uh, now we are adding a new dimension to our experimental design strategies. We were uh, earlier looking at uh, the uh, issues like uh, rotatability, spherical nature of the design, the scaled prediction variance variance of the uh, regression coefficients, the uh, analysis of variance, the uh, residual sum of squares, lack of fit and so on. The new dimension comes in the form of uh, identifying the direction in which we do the experiments and uh, obtain eventually the optimum uh, conditions. Uh, we also have to uh, ensure that uh, the uh, uh, conditions we have reached are truly uh, optimum. They are uh, maximum conditions if you want to maximize our objective function or minimum conditions uh, uh, if you want to minimize our objective function. We also have mathematical tools uh, available with us to indeed verify we have reached the optimum and not for example, a saddle point. When we start doing uh, experiments, we are really unsure uh, where exactly the optimum conditions are. We cannot uh, afford to uh, wander in the wilderness of uh, n dimensional experimental space in search for the optimum. A logical procedure is required to find the optimum conditions. So, we do some uh, preliminary experiments uh, to get an idea about the features of the experimental design space. What do I mean by features of an experimental design space? We want to see in the design space of consideration whether uh, only the main factors are contributing or there is interaction between the factors. We also want to see whether uh, there is uh, quadratic terms uh, uh, or uh, curvature effects uh, uh, assuming importance even in our restricted design space. The curvature uh, or quadratic uh, effects uh, manifest themselves in the form of uh, x 1 squared and x 2 squared terms in the model equation. So, we want to first check whether these terms are important. By restricting ourselves to a narrow design space initially, we ensure that we get an idea about the features of the experiment without uh, getting uh, complicated by the curvature or uh, quadratic terms. Even if interaction terms are not there, it is well and good. So, the response surface methodology deals with identifying the optimum settings of the factors in a systematic and planned fashion. So, let us uh, represent uh, the process initially only in terms of uh, the main factors x 1 and x 2. We are not considering the interaction between x 1 and x 2. And uh, when interactions are not considered, then uh, even more complicated terms like uh, x 1 squared and x 2 squared are not at all considered. But uh, this is uh, a simplified model we are starting with, but we have to ensure that uh, our model is uh, adequate or correct uh, and uh, the interaction terms and the quadratic terms are indeed uh, not present. So, here 
y represents the response x1 is the independent variable 1 or the factor 1, x2 is the independent variable 2 and epsilon is the independent error term. It is assumed to be normally distributed with mean 0 and constant variance sigma squared. We do not know sigma squared. So, after we fit the model parameters, the uh, model is uh, uh, represented by y hat is equal to beta hat naught plus sigma i equals 1 to 2 beta hat i x i. Uh, this is the prediction for uh, any uh, coordinate point in the experimental design space. So, what is meant by the method of steepest ascent? Even though we generally talk about the method of steepest ascent, you may also have to look at uh, steepest descent as well. If your objective function is to uh, maximize uh, or if your exercise is to maximize the objective function, then uh, you are looking for the direction of steepest ascent. And if your objective function involves minimization, then you are looking for the direction of steepest descent. So, what is steepest ascent? The steepest ascent method is a sequential process where we move in the direction of maximum increase in the response. And uh, if minimization is required, it is called as the method of steepest uh, descent. So, once we are in a preliminary uh, region, we want to move uh, ahead, then uh, we have to move as rapidly or as quickly as possible uh, in the direction where the response is. Uh, increasing the fastest. Okay. So, in that way we are uh, hopeful that we would eventually uh, reach the optimum condition as early as possible. So, how to identify the direction of steepest ascent in uh, maximization of the objective function problems. We want to look at the uh, direction of steepest descent in the uh, minimization of objective function problems. So, let us look at uh, process involving only uh, two main factors. There is no interaction between the two factors and uh, you are having x1 represented uh, as shown here and we assume that the scale for uh, x2 is the same as that for x1. Uh, and then what we do is we want to see uh, how to progress the fastest where the response would be increasing uh, very rapidly and you can see that these are uh, response uh, values, uh, these are constant response values as long as they are in the black line, the constant value is uh, z is equal to 5. Then when you go to the next uh, line, uh, this represents uh, locus of all points where the response value is 15. This corresponds to 25 and this corresponds to 35. And as I said earlier, the scales are the same on both axes. And if you want to progress along the direction of steepest increase in the responses, then we have to take a path which is perpendicular to the lines. And uh, since only main factors are involved, you are showing the response contours uh, in the form of straight lines. If there were considerable interactions between the two parameters x1 and x2, the uh, lines here would have become curves they would have been twisted because of the interaction effects. But fortunately as far as this model is concerned, it is a simple one and it is an additive model where only the factors uh, x1 and x2 influence the process. Even the interaction between uh, the two factors x1 and x2 is negligible. That is why the contours are straight lines and uh, the direction of steepest ascent is given in terms of a line which is perpendicular to the uh, constant value line. The direction of steepest ascent is the direction in which y hat increases most rapidly. It is taken as the line through the center of the region of interest and normal to the fitted surface. The steps along the path are proportional to the regression coefficients uh, uh, modulus of beta hat i. So, how do we take the steps along the path of the uh, steepest uh, ascent? Uh, please note that the steps along the path are proportional to the regression coefficients. So, we cannot uh, assume equal importance uh, to both the uh, axes. For example, if you are having two factors, we are looking at a two dimensional space and uh, we cannot say that if I move one step in the x1 direction, I will also move one step in the uh, y1 direction. 
because uh, each factor may not be contributing equally to the uh, process response and uh, hence it is clear that the direction of the steepest ascent would depend upon the relative importance of the two factors and the steps would be determined accordingly. So, how long do we conduct uh, the uh, experiments along the direction of steepest ascent? Please note that we are conducting experiments along the direction of steepest ascent and we are not predicting the responses. So, we conduct the experiments as long as uh, uh, the uh, response values are uh, increasing and uh, a point may be reached where uh, the values may begin to drop. So, we have reached the conditions where uh, the uh, maximum response is obtained. Then we have to pause here a bit and then reevaluate our experimental design strategy. So, let us uh, do this uh, understanding of uh, response surface methodology through an illustration. Uh, the problem statement goes like this, a machine is used for production of powders of a certain size and the machine operates at constant speed and is uh, fed with the uh, material, it may be a rock or whatever. The production rate in kilograms per hour of the machine depends upon the power supply to the machine and the raw material feed rate. The data are presented in the coded format. So, to obtain an idea about the experimental error, the experiments have been repeated at the geometric center of the design and the additional uh, role of center points will be explained shortly. So, you have the experimental data in coded format they are given here x1, x2 and y kg per hour and uh, x1 and x2 are not having any units because they are coded variables and they are representing a 2 power 2 design as shown here 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1 settings and the responses are given here. And you also have the center points, uh, repeats are carried out at the center points and these are the responses obtained from the 4 repeats. So, we calculate the variance. Uh, of the data obtained at the center points. So, we essentially find the variance of 68, 65, 61 and 62 which comes out to be a whole number 10 and this is a measure of the error variance and it is denoted by sigma hat squared or estimated error variance sigma hat squared. So, this is the estimation of the pure error only due to random factors. Now, uh, the conventional 2 power 2 factorial design is enhanced or augmented by 4 center points and the replicates of the center are uh, used to estimate the experimental error and allow for checking for the adequacy of the first order model. It uh, tells us uh, whether uh, a first order model we have proposed is sufficient or we need to consider the uh, effects of curvature by the addition of the quadratic terms. Uh, uh, beta 1 1 hat uh, x 1 squared or beta hat 1 1 x 1 squared and beta hat 2 2 x 2 squared. These represents the con uh, contributions from the uh, quadratic uh, effects. So, let us see how to use the center runs to detect whether quadratic effects are significant or not. So, before we do that let us uh, fit the design based on the available uh, data points. So, the first order model which we get uh, is of the form y hat is equal to beta hat naught plus uh, sigma i is equal to 1 to 2 beta hat i x i. This first order model assumes that the variables x 1 and x 2 have only an additive effect on the response. So, the first order model has uh, center points, it can estimate the uh, pure error. Uh, the first order model involving 4 uh, factorial points will not only enable you to find the main effects, but also to find the interaction. Because we are having uh, 4 independent settings for a 2 power 2 design, we can uh, find the uh, uh, intercept beta hat naught, then we can find the contribution from factor 1 or the importance of contribution from factor 1 which is uh, beta hat 1 and the importance of uh, contribution from factor 2 is uh, given from uh, uh, the uh, beta hat 2 coefficient. So, that makes it 3, we have 4 independent settings and so the uh, uh, remaining independent uh, setting may be also uh, used up 
in the calculation of uh, the interaction term beta hat 1 2. That means, uh, we are using 4 independent settings to find 4 parameters. We cannot estimate any more parameters from a 2 power 2 design. So, uh, even this limited uh, design with the center points has enabled us to find uh, a model with main factors and the interaction between the two main factors and also it has given us a good idea about the experimental error. Further, the center points uh, are invaluable in telling us whether quadratic effects are uh, important or not. It cannot tell you exactly what those quadratic contributions are. It will only tell whether you need to consider the quadratic uh, terms or you may at present uh, omit the quadratic terms. So, first let us look at the uh, estimation of error before we go into the uh, uh, testing for the significance of the quadratic terms. Let us do the simple things first, uh, which would be the estimation of the experimental error. That is a very straightforward task. We have to just find the variance of the four center points. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, sigma xi minus x bar whole square divided by n minus 1 or you may also do uh, sigma xi squared minus uh, uh, sigma x whole squared divided by uh, n whole thing divided by n minus 1. Well, you have uh, come across these uh, kind of calculations uh, in the previous uh, lectures. Let us take the shortcut formula here. So, sigma hat squared is equal to 68 squared plus 65 squared plus 61 squared plus 62 squared. What are these points? These are nothing but the values obtained at the center. They are the repeat points at the center and uh, 256 would be a uh, sum of all these four observations. 68 plus 65 is uh, 133, 194, 194 plus 62 is 256. So, that is what you have here and um, 4 would be the total number of repeats which is 1, 2, 3, 4 and then this uh, uh, 3 represents the degrees of freedom for the uh, 4 data points. Since, you are already calculating the mean from the 4 data points, we lose a degree of freedom there and we have only 3 as the degrees of freedom and we get sigma hat squared as 10. And uh, how do you find the main and interaction effects? Uh, to do it in a very economical manner and a universal manner, I would uh, suggest you to adopt the regression approach. You have the x matrix and you have the y vector of responses or the experimental uh, values obtained and uh, you simply use the regression approach to identify the model parameters. That is very straightforward and if you have uh, software like MATLAB or Scilab or uh, any uh, software which can do these kind of matrix uh, manipulations uh, routinely, uh, then the coefficients may be identified very quickly. But from a learning point of view, even for this uh, design with the center points, uh, uh, we can uh, identify the main effects and the interaction effects uh, using the factorial design approach. We use the table of contrasts and uh, from that we may uh, identify the different effects. We know that once the effects are identified, the coefficients are uh, uh, estimated by dividing the effects by 2 because the effects represents the change from going from minus 1 coded value to plus 1 coded value a jump of 2 units but a regression equation involves the uh, response when there is a change in one unit of a particular factor. So, the effects are divided by 2 to get the coefficients. Either you use the regression approach or you may use the factorial approach to estimate the parameters. So, if you want you can uh, do these uh, calculations since it is only a 2 power 2 design you may do these very easily and you may verify whether the results you obtain are matching with the results which are going to be presented. So, when you look at the uh, values, the uh, main effect is uh, having uh, a value of uh, 24, the main effect B is having a value of 30 and the interaction is having a value of 0. And the coefficient uh, for the uh, different effects are, uh, or different factors rather are uh, 12, 15 and 0. And the sum of squares uh, again may be easily calculated from the uh, uh, contrasts and they turn out to be 576 for uh, A and uh, 900 for B 
and uh, for AB it is 0. We can now construct the uh, ANOVA table and we have the degrees of freedom listed out here. Since we are having 4 repeats, we are having 3 degrees of freedom for the repeats and we found the uh, mean square uh, error or the variance as 10 and uh, we also have the mean squares for factors A, B and A, B and uh, so you have F naught value as 50, 576 divided by 10 for A, B it is actually 0. So uh, the probability P value comes out to be 1 for A, B and so that tells us you can comprehensively reject the uh, coefficient associated with the interaction between A and B. But you can see that both uh, Fx A and B are highly significant because their p values are very small. The critical F value is given by F 0.051,3 and that turns out to be 10.13 and uh, since these actual F values are much much higher than the critical uh, uh, F value, they lie in the rejection region and uh, hence you may reject the null hypothesis which states that the uh, coefficient corresponding to factor A and the coefficient corresponding to factor B are both uh, 0. So we reject the null hypothesis and say that both the factors are significant. Only the insignificant factor is the interaction between the two factors A and B. So from the analysis of variance test uh, from where uh, we get the F and the associated P values and perhaps even from uh, uh, visual inspection uh, which is uh, usually not trustworthy, it can be shown that the interaction term is currently unnecessary. If an interaction term were to be added then we would have had an additional coefficient beta hat 1, 2 and that would have been present here. But uh, as far as this model goes uh, we can neglect the beta hat 1, 2 because the interaction effect is not significant. So finally we have the fitted model as uh, y hat is equal to 63 plus 12 x1 plus 15 x2 and uh, we can see that the uh, uh, coefficients are given here. So in the preliminary uh, model, uh, in the preliminary uh, designed experiment we have the model given as shown here. Now let us move on to the uh, checks that are in place for the sufficiency of the linear model. We said that uh, the quadratic effects may be actually important even in this preliminary design space and uh, should we add uh, beta hat 1 1 x 1 squared and beta hat uh, 2 2 x 2 squared or we can get away without adding those uh, uh, model terms. That is what we have to check next. So what we do here is quite uh, simple, we take the average of the 4 corner points of the factorial design y bar f and compare it with the average of the center point values y bar c. So if you go back to the table as uh, shown here, so these are all the factorial points and these are the responses at the factorial points and these are all the uh, center points and these are the uh, values at the center points. So if you want to take the average y bar f, it would mean the average of the factorial points and uh, that would be uh, 150, 216, 216 plus 36 is uh, uh, 252, so 252 by uh, 4 is 63 and uh, this we saw as uh, 133, 194, 256, 256 by 4 is 64. So the average of the uh, factorial points is 63 and the average of the uh, center points is 64. So the difference between the two is very small. So we can uh, imagine that uh, y bar f, the average of the factorial points is located close to y bar c which is the average of the uh, center points. If you are going to have the second order uh, fx or the quadratic fx uh, important then uh, what would have happened is the center points would have lo been located 
very far off from the uh, factorial points. Then the average uh, of the factorial points would have been quite different from the average of the center points. So, if the averages between the center and factorial points are uh, pretty much the uh, same, then uh, we can uh, understand intuitively that uh, uh, the center points are uh, located uh, uh, very close to the plane containing the factorial points. In other words, if you look at the model surface, you do not see any strong uh, peaks and uh, valleys. Okay. So, we were uh, looking at uh, the uh, importance of the curvature terms. If you have strong curvature in your uh, design space, then the response uh, surface uh, would be characterized by peaks and uh, valleys, uh, which would mean that uh, if you are taking a plane uh, of four points, there may be a region in the center which is uh, considerably at uh, elevation with respect to the plane formed by the four points. That shows that uh, there is a strong curvature and peak in this experimental design space. So, we are having a center uh, and uh, then we have four factorial points. If the uh, center point uh, response is considerably different from the corner point uh, responses, then we may suspect uh, the presence of uh, peak uh, or uh, curvature in the design space between the factorial points and the center points. On the other hand, if the center point values are comparable and very close to the uh, four uh, uh, factorial points average, then we may think that they are uh, very close and we do not have any strong peak uh, uh, in the design space we have considered. So, with this uh, intuitive uh, understanding, uh, we can uh, carry out certain tests. So, the first step is to find the difference between y bar f and y bar c. So, if the difference between uh, y bar f and y bar c is considerable, then uh, we can uh, conclude that curvature effects may be important. What is that quadratic uh, effects or the second order effects? Uh, if they are significant, then the model should uh, have in addition to the regular uh, intercept, main factors and then binary interaction, it should also have beta hat 1 1 and beta hat 2 2. So, what we are doing here is checking for the linear model sufficiency by estimating the quadratic effects. The quadratic effects uh, are uh, characterized by beta hat 1 1 and beta hat 2 2. With the current uh, experimental design involving four factorial points and four center points, we are unable to estimate beta hat 1 1 and beta hat 2 2 for the simple reason that we do not have sufficient degrees of freedom. So, we are not in a position to estimate them explicitly, but we may have an idea uh, of uh, the importance of beta hat 1 1 plus beta hat 2 2 and that is uh, given by the estimator uh, y bar c minus y bar f. y bar c minus y bar f is acting as an estimator for beta 1 1 plus beta 2 2. So, we can call y bar c minus y bar f as beta hat 1 1 plus beta hat 2 2. And uh, so, uh, the difference between y bar c minus uh, y bar f we saw from our calculations that it is 64 minus 63 and that is equal to 1. So, an estimate of uh, beta 1 1 plus beta 2 2 has been obtained uh, from y bar c minus y bar f and that turns out to be 1. So, the null hypothesis which involves the actual parameters and not the estimated ones, please note that h naught is given by beta 1 1 plus beta 2 2 is equal to 0 and h 1 is given by beta 1 1 plus beta 2 2 not equal to 0. So, we are uh, using the actual population parameters 
in our hypothesis statements. And again to repeat, uh, y bar c minus y bar f <coughs> is used as an estimator for the coefficients beta 1 1 and beta plus beta 2 2. So, we can uh, do a t test which is uh, based upon uh, the uh, estimator uh, y bar f minus y bar c minus the uh, null hypothesis statement which says that uh, beta 1 1 plus beta 2 2 is equal to 0 that is why we put 0 here and then we have the variance of y bar f minus y bar c. And uh, this may be written as uh, y bar f minus y bar c whole thing divided by sigma into root of 1 by n f plus 1 by n c, where n is the number of factorial points and n c is the number of center points. And we can uh, take convert this uh, t test into an f test or convert the t statistic into an f statistic by squaring this term and we get f naught is equal to t naught squared which is y bar f minus y bar c whole squared divided by sigma squared into 1 by n f plus 1 by n c. So, whatever we have studied in the first phase of this course uh, hypothesis testing and important probability distributions we are making use now. And, uh, we do not know sigma squared, but uh, we have an easy solution for that. We have repeats at the center and we can use the mean square error as a surrogate value for sigma squared and we call that as a sigma hat squared. So, now the variance is based on center points and it may be substituted as an estimate for the error variance and so you have f naught is equal to y bar f minus y bar c whole squared by sigma hat squared into 1 by n f plus 1 by n c. So, converting this into an f statistic, we test the equivalent to the null hypothesis that the numerator sum of squares degrees of freedom is 1 given by y bar f minus y bar c whole squared by 1 by n f plus 1 by n c is equivalent to the mean square error. So, this f statistic is tested with 1 and n c minus 1 numerator and denominator degrees of freedom respectively. So, how do you calculate the sum of squares of the pure quadratic? So, when you simplify this particular expression which is given here, we get uh, n f into n c y bar f minus y bar c whole squared by n f plus n c which is number of factorial points 2 power 2 which is 4, number of center points 4 and y bar f minus y bar c whole squared is uh, 1 squared divided by uh, 4 plus 4 which is 8 and that turns out to be 2. So, when you divide the sum of squares of the pure quadratic by sigma hat squared, we get 2 by 10 which is equal to 0.2. So, the f value is 0.2 and this f value is associated with the p value of 0 0.685 which is uh, very high and tells that the uh, curvature term is insignificant because the p value is much higher than 0.05. So, both the main effects are significant while the interaction and the pure curvature effects are not significant. So, we can say that uh, the model may be well represented by y hat is equal to 63 plus 12 x 1 plus 15 x 2. In order to find the direction of steepest ascent, uh, what we do is we convert this into x 2 versus x 1 form. When we do that, we can show very easily that uh, 15 x 2 is y hat minus 12 x 1 minus 63. So, x 2 is equal to minus uh, 63 by uh, 15 which is minus 4.2 and uh, then you have for x 1 minus 12 x 1 by 15 which is minus 0 0.8 and then for y hat coefficient it will be simply 1 by 15 which turns out to be 0 0.0667. So, what we have to do is uh, use this equation to find the uh, path of steepest ascent. So, what we do here is we draw contour lines for constant y hat using this equation. We fix y hat at uh, a certain value and then draw this line. Then we fix y hat at another value and draw another line. This way we can generate sufficient number of contour lines 
in the experimental design space of interest. And what is the slope m1 of this equation? The slope is given by uh, minus 0.8 because we are plotting x2 versus x1, where y is a parameter and it is kept at different different values. So, the main important uh, defining relationship is between x2 and x1 and if I take the slope of uh, this particular equation dx2 by dx1 would be equal to minus 0.8 and that is the slope. And if you want to find the direction uh, normal to this uh, slope, then we have to find a slope which is bearing a relation m1 m2 is equal to minus 1. m1 is the slope of the original line, m2 is the slope of the new line in the direction of steepest ascent. To get uh, the slope of the line in the direction of steepest ascent, we have to find m2 and the relation is m1 m2 is equal to minus 1. Since m1 is known, we can easily find out m2. So, the slope m1 of this equation which was given before that is y hat is equal to 63 plus 12 x1 plus 15 x2 or x2 is minus 4.2 minus 0.8 x1 plus 0 0.06667. So, the slope initially is minus 0.8 minus 0.8 and we have to find m2 the slope of the line of steepest ascent such that the relation m1 m2 is equal to minus 1 is satisfied. This uh, equation comes in the normal calculations. So, here we get m2 is equal to minus 1 by minus 0.8 which is 1.25. So, here we are sketching the uh, responses, we are fixing different responses for y, y is 5, y is uh, 30, y is 70 and y is uh, 100. So, these are the different responses and uh, you can see that uh, for each of this uh, response y there is a line. So, for y is equal to 5 we have this line, for y is equal to uh, 30 we have this line for y is equal to 70 we have this line and y is equal to 100 we have this line and uh, all of these lines have a slope of minus 0.8. In order to identify the direction of steepest ascent we have to find a line with slope of 1.25 and the and the line is represented here. Since the scales are not the same in both x and y axis you can see that this line is not exactly perpendicular to the lines, but it is slightly at an angle but it still represents the direction of steepest ascent because it is drawn with the slope of m2 is equal to uh, 1.25. Right. So, this is a close up view of the same figure which I showed previously and it can be seen that this is the path taken uh, in the direction of steepest ascent and the slope of this particular line is 1.25. I am drawing this line starting from the center of the design which is the origin and uh, so, you can see that uh, for every uh, um, one step I am taking along the x1 direction, I am taking a step of 1.25 along the x2 direction. Now, I have the direction of steepest ascent and uh, please remember that the values are in the coded format. So, uh, persisting in the same coded format, if I take a step of uh, 1 unit along the x1 direction, I take a step of 1.25 uh, units along the y direction or x2 direction, not the y direction, y is the response. Uh, if I take a step of 1 unit along the uh, x1 direction, I take a step of 1.25 units along the x2 direction. Please note that the step sizes uh, along each of the two directions need not be the same because the regression coefficients are uh, different. There is a different weightage given for factor 1 and different weightage given for factor 2 and uh, hence the uh, direction of steepest ascent also has to respect this different weightages. And uh, when you are doing experiments in real life, uh, please uh, keep a track on uh, your actual experimental value corresponding to the coded variables. Okay. Sometimes uh, when you are going along a direction of steepest ascent, you are going 1, uh, 1.25 or 2, 2.5 and so on. Uh, 
the response may be uh, increasing all the time, but uh, you may not be able to go beyond a certain point for the simple reason uh, because the pump would have saturated or uh, the flow rate uh, would have hit its maximum upper bound. So, you have to stop at that particular point. So, you cannot in some cases you cannot do experiments uh, indefinitely until you get to the true optimum because you may hit a bound uh, caused by the boundaries of your experimental design. Uh, you may not be able to cross the boundary for various practical reasons. So, what I am trying to say here is when you are going along a particular direction uh, in the coded format, keep also a track on the actual values. We know that the coded format uh, is uh, done in order to uh, put the uh, factors independent of units and assign them uh, equal importance. Now, uh, once you have a coded value, you should also have the uncoded value. In one of my earlier lectures, I have given you the uh, formula for converting uh, coded values into uncoded values and uh, vice versa. Please refer to that. So, when you are going along this direction of steepest ascent, please make sure that you are not hitting a bound uh, created by the constraints of your experimental program. All right. And another important thing is in the direction of steepest ascent, you are doing the experiments. You are not uh, using the prediction model uh, which you had developed uh, earlier. The prediction model was carried out over a narrow design space and uh, you ensured that there is no curvature effects present in that narrow design space. And then it also helped you to identify the path of the steepest ascent. So, from that preliminary region, you are going along the path of steepest ascent and uh, that is helping you to uh, proceed as quickly as possible. But once you have crossed that uh, minus 1 plus 1 boundary corresponding to that narrow design space, you should stop using the model prediction. You should actually perform experiments along the path of the steepest ascent and from the experimental responses decide when to stop. Okay, I have hit my bounds, so I cannot go further on from here, so I will stop or I am reaching an optimum response value and I will pause here to uh, re-evaluate my design strategy. So, if you are lucky enough to get to the second stage where your uh, response is uh, showing an optimal value and then uh, is showing a maximum value and then declining, you want to stop at that point and uh, pause a bit and uh, re-evaluate your design strategy. So, the experimenter has to meticulously do the experiment and measure the responses. He proceeds according to the table given in the next slide. The observed yield increases until a value of about 95, observed at 2, 2.5 in the coded format and then starts decreasing. So, that particular figure is as follows. This is where you uh, started and then when you proceed, you find at the uh, third step you are having a maximum value corresponding to about 95 and then the values start uh, declining, declining. The production rate in kilograms per hour has reached a maximum of 95 at about uh, the third step and remember that you are going uh, for one unit along the uh, x1 direction, you are going 1.25 units along the uh, x2 direction. So, this is the point where you have to pause a bit and reevaluate your design strategy. So, what we do is uh, uh, once you have reached that optimum location, you will be having a new set of coordinates corresponding to that. There again you recode your experimental settings uh, as minus 1 and plus 1. Again, this is very straightforward. Uh, so, and this helps us to carry out the design on a uniform basis, so that we do not have odd numbers, uh, odd values like 1.27, 3.56 and so on. We are always working with minus 1 plus 1. So, whenever we uh, adopt a new experimental design strategy, uh, we have to recode those experimental settings as a minus 1 plus 1 format. 
but we have to keep track on all the transformations. So, at any point we should be able to convert the coded uh, values into the actual uncoded experimental settings that is what is of interest to the experimenter and these things are done very uh, easily. I will just go to the board and tell you how the coding and uh, uncoding is done. So, the <coughs> a thing in coded uh, form is very simple. This is the uh, actual x value minus x average divided by x max minus x average. So, let us say that you are having data points 30, 40 and uh, 50 and if I am looking at 30 uh, then it would be 30 minus average of 30, 40, 50 is 40 divided by max is 50 minus 40 and this turns out to be 30 minus 40 is minus 10 divided by 10 which is minus 1. Now, when I am having 40, this is corresponding for x is equal to 30, this is minus 1 coded value and for uh, x is equal to 40, it is uh, coded value is equal to 0 which is the center point for that particular x and for x is equal to uh, uh, 50, we have 50 minus 40 divided by 50 minus 40 which is plus 1 as the coded value. So, for any experimental set of uh, data, we are able to convert it into minus 1 plus 1 coded format. So, in the new uh, so called optimum uh, location, we are again recoding our uh, values and uh, we get the responses as 85, 95 and uh, 92.5. So, at 2 and uh, 2.5, we are uh, getting the maximum response 95. So, these values are now coded values and those coded values are uh, 1, 2 and 3. Okay, this is the original coding. Now, we have to recode these values as minus 1. So, 1 will become a new minus 1, 2 will become a new 0 and 3 will become a new plus 1. Similarly, 1.25 will become a new minus 1, 2.5 will become a new 0 and 3.75 will become a new plus 1. So, the methodology I showed in the board can be adopted to code these values into minus 1 plus 1 format. So, now we are uh, in a new situation where we are hit a maximum. This itself indicates that there is a curvature and a peak and a valley kind of uh, region in the new experimental design space. So, a simple model involving the main factors and the interaction between the two main factors will be definitely insufficient. So, we have to capture the quadratic terms or the peak and valley uh, coefficients uh, correctly and efficiently. And for this reason, we cannot stick with the uh, original factorial design and the center points. We need to augment the uh, original factorial design with axial locations. So, we are now going in for the central composite design where we in where we add axial points in addition to the existing factorial points and center points. And uh, for two factors, the axial points are located at uh, plus or minus root 2 0 and uh, 0 plus or minus root 2. And this is the uh, design matrix uh, for the central composite design. And you can see that in the recorded format, we have the factorial points shown in green color, the axial points shown in blue color and the center points shown in red color. 
and when we do experiments at these uh, conditions, these are the production rates obtained. So, at this point uh, uh, we can also show it graphically or f uh, in the form of a figure. You can see that uh, these were the uh, factorial points and this represents the center points or the central points and then these represent the axial points and they are located at minus 1.414 plus 1.414 uh, plus 1.414 and minus 1.414. So, these are uh, the uh, axial points. So, in addition to the factorial points and the center points, we have the axial points and this represents the central composite design strategy. And what is the second order model we are testing with? The second order model we are testing is beta naught plus beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 plus beta 1 2 x 1 x 2 beta 1 1 x 1 squared beta 2 2 x 2 squared plus the error term or uh, the predicted expression or the predicted equation is given as y hat is equal to beta not beta hat not plus beta hat 1 x 1 plus beta hat 2 x 2 plus beta hat 1 2 x 1 x 2 plus beta hat 1 1 x 1 squared plus beta hat 2 2 x 2 squared. So, this completes our uh, initial uh, discussion on the response surface uh, methodology. We will be uh, looking at uh, another example involving the central composite design and uh, we will see how to uh, uh, estimate the uh, beta hat uh, 1 1 and beta hat 2 2 and uh, we can also see uh, whether these particular uh, additional terms are significant or not. And uh, once we have done that, we also uh, have to locate uh, the uh, optimum condition. It is not enough that we identify the optimum condition, we have to characterize the optimum condition also. First, we have to tell whether the obtained optimum condition is a maximum or a minimum. Sometimes it can even be neither. You may be sitting on a saddle and um, there may not be any change in the value along a particular direction. So, that may also happen, we do not know. And even though we may have, we may have hit a extremum point, we have to see whether it is a maximum or a minimum and some mathematical tools are available with this and uh, we can use them. This is a very important aspect of experimental design and uh, perhaps uh, represents the uh, uh, ultimate point in experimental design strategies. So, we have done experiments in a efficient manner, planned manner using factorial design concept. And now, we have added an addi additional dimension to the entire exercise by using uh, design of experiments to find the optimum location. So, we will continue in the next lecture with a suitable example involving the central composite design. Thanks for your attention.